Hello and welcome to Back to the Science. I'm Dr. Susan Oliver and I'm a scientist and this is Cindy Oliver and she's a dog. Now, a few weeks ago, ITV made a documentary about the Lucy Letby case that was just loaded with errors. At the time, I was getting ready for a ski trip and Cindy was getting ready to be spoiled by my mum, so we didn't really have time to address any of it. We still don't have time to address all of it, but there is one particular section of bollocks that seems to have struck a chord with a lot of people, and that is a claim by two engineers who think they have come up with a plausible explanation for the blood test that proved Letby had poisoned at least two babies with insulin. Spoiler alert, they haven't. Now, before I start, though, I do need to declare a conflict of interest. I have actually appeared on ITV on the This Morning Show. This was after Lucy Letby had been arrested, but before she was charged. And I was compensated for this appearance. They bought me a cup of coffee and also gave me a bag of goodies, which, amongst other things, contained this lovely tray. Needless to say, they weren't talking to me about Lucy Letby or about insulin poisoning, and you wouldn't expect them to because I am not an expert in the area. My PhD is in nanomedicine, and although I have done immunoassays, I am definitely not an expert in insulin or its effects on the body. The experts are paediatric endocrinologists or biochemists, depending on what aspect you are looking at. So that's who they would have got on if they wanted to discuss the insulin poisonings. Oh, hang on, they didn't. They spoke to two engineers who do modelling. And if you're not familiar with modelling, it uses real-world data and a bunch of fancy equations to try and predict what will happen in other situations. This is an example from a paper published by Professor Chase on insulin secretion as a function of blood glucose levels. The dots are the data points and the lines are the model that has been fitted. And what they have found is that they can better fit the data for females if they split them for males, but that isn't the case for males. It's cool stuff. And I am totally in awe of the people who do it. But you don't require a lot of actual expertise in the subject area you are modeling to develop the models. You just need a basic understanding and the data. The expertise you require is modeling. And I know this because I used to share an office with someone who did modeling and we had many conversations about it. Modelers collaborate with people who are experts in the subject area. And you will see these people in the author list as well as the modelers on modeling papers. Now, I have previously made a video looking at the various claims being made by Letby supporters about the insulin results and why they are either false or misleading. So I won't repeat everything again. But to understand the specific claim being made by the engineers, I do just need to reiterate one point. There is only one way that your body can produce insulin, and that is by cleaving a molecule known as proinsulin into insulin and C peptide. This is the case for adults, for children, for newborn babies, premature babies, and even babies who are still in the womb. However, the body clears insulin much faster than it clears C peptide. So, although they are made in equal amounts, you can expect the insulin to C peptide ratio to always be below one, except in people with certain medical conditions, which none of the babies or their mothers had, and we will take a bit. We will talk a bit about that later. In the babies that Let- Letby has so far been convicted of poisoning, it was between 27.5 and infinity for baby F because his C peptide was undetectable and it was 4.2 for baby L. But according to the two engineers, they have come up with an explanation that paediatric endocrinologists and biochemists have missed that explains the extraordinary blood test results obtained for Letby's victims. Let's have a listen. Okay, so unfortunately I can't show you the clip, 
My original version of this video got flagged as soon as I uploaded it for infringing ITV's copyright. I thought we were friends, guys. Anyway, so you're not going to get any respite from my annoying voice as I am going to have to read out the transcript. I will spare you my annoying hand movements, so. So it starts with Helen Shannon. We've spent hundreds of hours investigating every facet of the science, and there is a completely obvious solution that does not involve poisoning. Then we have the voiceover. According to the two scientists, to understand the insulin cases, it's essential to recognise the differences between newborn babies and adults. Back to Helen Shannon. The insulin cases applied basic clinical guidance for healthy adults to tiny preterm compromised neonates. Now, before I continue with the transcript, I just have to say that what we've heard so far is complete and utter bollocks. The key witness for the prosecution for the insulin cases was a paediatric endocrinologist. It's laughable to claim that he applied clinical guidance for healthy adults. Anyway, let's continue. We have a voiceover. They say they've established something important, which suggests that even if the insulin readings were accurate, they still didn't prove poisoning. Many newborn babies or neonates are born with a specific type of antibody in their blood. The team say they can show that insulin produced naturally by the babies can stick to these antibodies staying longer in the bloodstream and giving a higher reading while C peptide continues to be cleared. Then back to Helen Shannon. Something that is unique to neonates is that they have quite a high level of antibodies in their blood. Comes from their mums. So because the antibody binds to the insulin, the insulin doesn't remove from the body and the level of insulin bound to the antibody goes up and up and up and up in the bloodstream. It doesn't have any effect on the child at all. It just floats around and as a result gives a very high reading on the particular test that was used at the Liverpool Laboratory. So what was presented in court as this is smoking gun evidence of poisoning actually looks pretty typical for a preterm neonate and we can't see any justification whatsoever for the prosecution's statement that it could only be poisoning. Okay, at face value, this sounds pretty convincing, but without even going into the science, there's a major problem with this claim. According to Ms. Shannon, the insulin bound to antibodies just floats around and doesn't have any effect on the baby. Well, this wasn't the case for the two babies that let be poisoned. Both babies had severe and persistent hypoglycemia. A hallmark of pseudoscience is to take some science and then add a whole lot of bollocks to it to create a story that sounds logical and convincing but isn't actually correct. And this is exactly what Chase and Shannon have done. They start with a scientific fact. Babies are born with antibodies, which they get from their mother. These are IgG antibodies and partially protect babies from pathogens in the first few months of life until they produce their own antibodies from vaccination or infection. This is known as passive immunity. However, the amount of antibodies a baby receives from its mother is very dependent on its gestational age, with premature babies having much lower levels of antibodies than full-term babies. Both of the babies that let be poisoned with insulin were premature. Baby F was born at 29 weeks and 5 days, and baby L was born at 33 weeks and 2 days. So you'd expect their antibody levels to be lower than full-term infants. Okay, so already this story is sounding pretty shaky because we know that antibody levels are lower in preterm babies. But is it possible that antibodies can bind to insulin and slow down the rate insulin is removed from the bloodstream? 
Absolutely. This happens in a rare disease called insulin autoimmune syndrome or Herata disease. In this condition, antibodies initially bind to insulin, which lowers the rate that insulin leaves the bloodstream and concurrently stops insulin removing glucose from the bloodstream. This results in hyperglycemia or high blood glucose, which means the body releases even more insulin and, of course, more C peptide. Over time, though, the insulin bound to the antibodies is released, which raises the level of free insulin, which then leads to hypoglycemia or low blood sugar. And this cycle of hyperglycemia followed by hypoglycemia is repeated again and again and again. Needless to say, this bears no resemblance to what happened with either baby F or baby L. They both had persistent hypoglycemia, which failed to respond to standard treatment, but magically got better when the source of the insulin was removed. Furthermore, although people with Herata disease do generally end up with more insulin than C-peptide in their bloodstream, they still have elevated levels of C-peptide not low levels as is seen in cases of exogenous insulin administration. In fact, there is only one recorded case of Herata disease in a baby. And this was a case of secondary Herata disease in a baby whose mother developed Herata disease during pregnancy. Neither of the mothers of the babies poisoned by Letby had Herata disease. So what about babies whose mothers don't have Herata syndrome? Well, Sydney has done a bit of a deep dive into this, and there are a number of studies showing that cord blood from newborns contains a molecule that binds insulin. This is not actually from IgG antibodies, though. More importantly, this doesn't lead to high insulin concentrations. We know this because a number of studies have been done looking at both insulin antibody levels as well as insulin levels in both mothers and their babies. And this is not new research either. Shannon and Chase haven't found something new that no one knew about. This particular study is from 1995. Now, Professor Chase also appeared on a BBC Panorama documentary essentially repeating the same claims as were made on the ITV documentary. Let's have a quick look at that too. It relies on the work of a mechanical engineer who carries out biomedical research. He says he has research that shows there's a natural explanation for high levels of insulin and low levels of C-peptide in premature babies. Preterm infants in these studies have these antibodies that can bind to insulin and effectively store it. It acts like a bank account and it stores it in the body and doesn't clear. For baby F, the C peptide is less than 169. The insulin is over 4,500. It says in this report that that is within the expected range for preterm infants. Is that accurate? It is not the best word choice, to be direct. We would say the word is not uncommon. Is it normal? There is no definition of normal for preterm neonate. Because nobody measures these infants regularly, nobody knows what normal is. Ooh, nice shot walking through the train station. Much more professional than someone sitting on their lounge with their dog. Although... He obviously didn't get a train from New Zealand, so I'm not sure why they are showing the scene. Anyway, we have the same antibody nonsense that we know is wrong. Chase doesn't even seem to realise that antibody levels are lower in preterm babies than in full-term babies. But then he gets some mild pushback from the interviewer and he has to backtrack his claims, finishing with a rather lame we don't know what is normal because no one measures preterm infants regularly. Well, levels aren't regularly measured in preterm neonates whose glucose levels are normal, 
but they are measured in preterm neonates who have persistent hypoglycemia, like the babies let be poisoned. So although Professor Chase may not be familiar with what is normal, clinicians who work with premature babies and biochemists who perform the tests certainly are. And they know that in premature babies who haven't been given insulin, the normal insulin to C peptide ratio is below one. There's also this perspective study here that looked at 48 preterm low weight infants and compared C peptide and insulin levels within seven days of birth, which is in black, with the levels at 36 weeks post menstrual age, which is in gray. As you can see, Both C peptide and insulin levels are higher in preterm infants, but the C peptide level remains above the insulin level in both cases. And there are many, many more studies showing a similar picture, but I won't bore you with them. So, in summary, as with most purveyors of pseudoscience, Chase and Shannon have taken a few things that are factually correct and mix them up with a whole load of bollocks to tell a story that sounds convincing, but is in fact bollocks. If you'd like to look further into the data I've presented, I've provided links in the video's description. And if you want to look further into why the various other claims being made about the insulin results by Let Me supporters are also bollocks, I will also provide a link to my previous insulin video as well as a link to an excellent deep dive article by a guy called Ben Cole. And please remember, all this info is about the science, but you shouldn't take it as medical advice. For that, you should speak to your medical practitioner. If you've got this far, thank you for listening. And if you've liked, shared or commented on the video, double thank you because that helps the algorithm and means that more people will see the video. And of course, thank you to everybody who has Bought me a coffee or little Cindy here a treat. There we go, little Cindy. We really appreciate your support. And thanks again to ITV for this beautiful tray. We will be continuing to make videos about the science in the future. So if you'd like to join the cool kids and stay informed, please hit the subscribe button. Thank you.